Welcome to Homeschool Your Way. My name is Jana Cook. I'm your host and the community manager at Bookshark. Today in this episode, I am joined with Ann Carico. She is the creator of It's Not That Hard to Homeschool. We're going to be delving into some misconceptions around homeschooling and why people feel like they can't do it. But most of all, we're here to encourage you to let you know that this is something that anyone can do if they choose to do it. Ann, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So you have been homeschooling for quite a while. Why don't you tell our audience how you got into this wonderful world of homeschool? Um, quite a while is right. 22 years in total, graduated my fifth child in May of 21. So um, it was quite a ride. We had five kids in eight and a half years. So uh, there was a time there where uh, they just all kind of came into homeschooling and then sort of left the house in a hurry too. And what was going on was um, actually when my, I only had three kids and uh, they were young, very young, like too, too early for school. We had a couple of babysitters from our church that were homeschooled teens. And we were so impressed with them. We actually all also helped out in the youth group at church. So we were kind of able to compare, if you will, the homeschooled teens to the non-homeschooled teens. And we chose the homeschooled teens to babysit our kids. And then the more we interacted with them, the more we saw that they looked us in the eye, they did what we asked them to do. They spent their time at our house engaging with our kids, not just putting them in front of a movie and then doing their own thing. Um, and uh, they were responsible and also they owned up to their mistakes, all of these wonderful qualities that we saw in these homeschooled teens. And it's gonna sound funny, <laughs> but we decided to homeschool our kids all the way through high school before the oldest even started kindergarten because we just saw the product and that's what we wanted for our family. So a lot of people say, you know, make a year by year decision and that's fine for a lot of people. But for us, we were in it for the long haul from the start. And so that's what we did. And it was a great ride for us as a family, you know, always ups and downs and growth times and happier times. But all, all of it was just the idea of uh, building up our kids' character and teaching them how to learn. And now they're all, yeah, I guess I can call them all adults. The youngest will be 20 <laughs> in December, so close enough, right? And uh, they're all adults that are responsible you know, living their lives responsibly, being productive members of society, and that I enjoy hanging out with. <laughs> and so to me, that was the ultimate goal. And, and I'm happy with that. If that's not a testament to successful homeschooling, I'm not sure there, there is one. So when you were in the thick of it, what inspired you to create It's Not That Hard to Homeschool? Hmm. Yeah, well, um, in actuality, it started out as AnnieAndEverything.com, play on my name, uh, because I was blogging about just about everything. I had recipes, I had budget you know, ideas, I had all sorts of stuff, but um, the homeschooling articles seemed to resonate the most. And then the homeschooling high school articles seemed to be really where people, there was a need that I could meet. And so I honed in on that pretty quickly. Uh, it's kind of funny, the one article, the, one of the beginning high school articles that I wrote was entitled, It's Not That Hard to Homeschool High School. And, and it just really resonated with people. They were hearing from a, you know, when you do your research and the same thing happened to me, when you do your research about high school, it gets super intimidating, super fast because there are all sorts of lists that the experts want to give you that you should do this and you should do that. And if you don't do this, you're shortchanging your kid and yada, yada, yada. And, um, I looked at all of it and I was like, I can't do all that. Um, my husband had to remind me, and we're homeschoolers, we don't have to do all that. And so we designed our homeschool to fit our family, not what all the experts or the other people were talking about. You know, as long as you're fulfilling your state homeschool law, that's the only have to, that's the only thing people can actually say you should do. And I obviously support that. But beyond that, it's all your choice. And so that's the message that people needed to hear. And uh, I'm pretty good at being, you know, uh, <laughs> finding the easier ways to do things, <laughs> finding ways to do things that aren't stressful and don't put a big burden on my shoulders. Um, so 
it became my message to tell that to people about high school and they've really seemed to be encouraged to hear it and thankful to hear it. It's interesting to hear you talk because I myself was homeschooled during high school in the nineties. And now being a homeschool mom in the 2000s, right? Mm -hmm. And we really have seen such a shift in in the things that are accessible to homeschoolers and what you can do with homeschool. Now, looking back at my experience, I'm kind of like, I think maybe I was more like a correspondence schooler Mm -hmm. in high school. I mean, granted, Mm -hmm. yes, I did it at home, but it was nothing like you know, just doing what was, you know, making sure what was required. I mean, they told us what to do. And I feel like mm-hmm. more and more homeschool is become the opposite of that. We, mm-hmm. We're not being told what to do. We are really living education with our children in everyday life. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe I should change my bio that maybe I really wasn't homeschooled in high school that. <laughs> I don't think you should change it. And here's why. Every family gets to decide for themselves what version of homeschooling works for them. And so for some people, it is that whole exploratory, hey, we're going to learn as we go, you know, and that is really enjoyable for them. And they don't get stressed out by that, you know, and they're okay with maybe it being a less structured environment. That's great for them. On the other side of the scale, there are the people that actually set up desks in their dining room, you know, and mom sits at her desk and the kids all sit at their desk and they're using textbooks all day. I have no problem with either one. And as far as correspondence school goes for high school, again, I have no problem with that. Um, it's not, to me, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say something really maybe potentially controversial. To me, it's not about the education itself. To me, it's mm-hmm. about the family dynamic. It's about keeping the family unit together. It's about um, not developing all these individual lives, but rather having family interdependence. And it's also about teaching our kids their, you know, character, and it's about teaching them how to learn. So um, uh, there are many different ways to learn. And so I just want to take any kind of burden you're starting to think about or anything anybody who is listening or watching might be thinking about that there's, you know, only if you're doing the exploratory education type of thing for homeschool, that's the only right way to homeschool. No, no, no. In fact, I wrote an article, a guest article on the iHomeschool Network blog that says in defense of school at home, because a lot of people say, oh, but it's homeschool. It's not school at home. I'm okay with school at home. I say, however you need to do your homeschool that fits your family, that fits your organization level, that fits your need for structure versus need for, you know, less structure. I think that's still homeschooling because it's still being held at home and you're still deciding what curriculum you're going to use. If, and even if that's a correspondence school, that's something you've decided to do. It's, different when we're going through the public school and they're telling us, you know, everything to have, but we're learning on the video at home, but we're still enrolled in the public school. That's different. But what you did, your parents chose that for you because that's what worked best for your family. And I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Don't even, don't even worry about it. (laughs) And, and that's why we can be friends. So I was thinking (laughs) that while I was you know, homeschooling, correspondence schooling, however we, if, if we need to make these definitions, regardless, right. I, don't think I so. was getting my school done on my own within a few hours. And I worked almost full time mm-hmm. in my junior and senior year. So I had mm-hmm. interaction at a company mm-hmm. with adults. I mm-hmm. think it really propelled my love of communication mm-hmm. and interpersonal skills that I don't know that I ever would have had without those experiences. So I definitely... Mm-hmm. I know there was purpose in that for me. And mm-hmm. even um, for my girls, as we look at what they're doing, they are, they're doing several things, right? Like now it's almost like homeschool opens up this beautiful journey of making the priority, the priority, right? Mm-hmm. So my girls not only are taking college courses at, at 16, they are working, which mm-hmm. like, 
I sometimes like, ah, oh, they're working. But and then I remember my experience. I said, that was really good for me. And mm-hmm. then one of my daughters um, plays volleyball for the local high school. And so yeah. we have all these opportunities that mm-hmm. if we were boxed in with a certain type of education, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. And for my husband and I, we really believe that education not only should be the love of learning, but creating responsibility and knowing you how what your civic duties are. Mm-hmm. My daughter the other day said, oh, I think I'm going to call out of work because I want to do something. And we were both like, whoa, excuse me. We yeah. don't just call out of work because you want to do something. And when then she explained to us that actually she meant she was going to see if someone could cover her shift ah, so that she different. could go do something else. And <laughs> after we both got really worked up uh-huh. and I said, okay, I'm so glad we we talked about this because your dad and I were really starting to worry about your character that you're just uh-huh. going to leave your, you know, coworkers high and dry because something better came up. And, and those are the type of things that when you homeschool in high school, uh-huh. it's, it's a different experience than when you're homeschooling your elementary age children. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. So many more possibilities out there for sure. And again, it's just about whatever is best for your family. And I just want to, I just want to, I don't care how many times I say that, but choose what suits your teen and your family. And actually as the homeschool mom, we also need to take ourselves into account, you know, uh, we need to maintain our sanity <laughs> um, so that everything runs smoothly. So also it's got to suit you. So let's talk a little bit more about how it's not that hard to homeschool high school. Mm-hmm. I know that some buzzwords that are, are around right now in high school education is concurrent enrollment, dual mm-hmm. enrollment. Mm-hmm. So since you have already walked through some of that, mm-hmm. why don't we just talk about um, your feelings behind the pros and the cons of these opportunities that parents and teens have now in high school? That is a great kind of next question from what we were just talking about, because again, you're right. They are buzzwords. Dual enrollment is one of the biggest buzzwords right now. And The problem with it is that everybody thinks that if they're not doing it, they're not doing a good job homeschooling. And I just want to say that's not true. There are so many factors to consider about dual enrollment that people don't realize. And so the, you know, the pros are totally, yes, if your kid is doing dual enrollment, and for those that don't know, it means that your kid is taking college classes during the high school years and thereby getting college credit and high school credit for the one class. Um, So if your kid's going to the community college and taking say, uh, I don't know, English composition, then they can use that as a language arts credit for their high school diploma. And they can also possibly transfer that credit as a college credit to wherever they wanna go to college and then they don't have to take it again in college. And so, I mean, it sounds great when you put it like that, wonderful, but it's not a good fit for everyone. And so I really encourage people to think that through. Um, It's, you just have to remember your kid has to be a college student if they're taking college classes. So you kind of don't become the homeschool mom anymore. They have to be the ones communicating with the professor about every single thing. They have to be the ones following the syllabus. They have to be the ones getting their work done on time. Um, so if they don't have the maturity level to do that, it won't be a good fit for them. There are uh, just tons of other factors involved in dual enrollment that people don't think about, and then they feel bad when it doesn't work out for them. And I'm here to say that, to be honest with you, I, I think dual enrollment is not a good fit for the majority of families and students, rather than the other way around. None of my kids had it. We live really rural. And when it came time for us to think about doing that with my oldest kid, it was me that was going to have to drive her three times a week, 45 minutes away to this campus when I had four other smaller children or younger children, I should say, in the house that I'm trying to, you know, help them do their homeschooling and whatnot. And um, it just wasn't possible for us, not to mention we're not in a state where it's free. So it was would have involved significant expense. And so we didn't do it. And none of my kids had dual enrollment. And they got into colleges just fine. I think one thing to remember is we don't have to validate our homeschool. We don't have to validate our homeschool diploma. 
And I think that's one reason that a lot of people do dual enrollment is, oh, I want to prove to them that my kid can handle college level work. It, you know, and that's, that means my homeschool was a good homeschool. Colleges don't expect any of their applicants to be able to handle college level work before getting to college. They just don't. There are too many high schoolers all across the country that don't have any kind of dual enrollment going on. Um, for some reason, as homeschoolers, we seem to think it's what we're supposed to do. Um, but when you look at the public school students across America, it's just a small percentage of them that are getting that opportunity at all. And so colleges are expecting your kid to be able to handle high school level work, not college level work. So if you have a diploma that's just high school classes, that is okay. It's totally okay. <laughs> so I kind of, I don't know if that's where you were going with that. I kind of honed in on that, but um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a hot, hot button topic with me because I hear it so often and I don't want parents to get discouraged or to take on more than is good for their teen or their family. So we are a family that actually is utilizing this uh -huh. for a yeah. number of reasons. And, uh -huh. and I, it's not actually probably going to work out for my youngest. So my uh -huh. twins have October birthdays. So they were always the oldest of their class. And believe me, when it came time to say what grade they were, I wanted to change their birthday because them being twins, I, I needed them to go to preschool, right? Like I was right. that mom. I never yeah. wanted to homeschool my kids. <laughs> Anyone who's listened to any of my episodes know that that was not <laughs> my idea of have children and homeschool them, even though I was homeschooled. So it's kind of funny, but it ended up being that because they were almost a year older than most of their peers in any type of educational setting, they mm -hmm. tended to be more, a little more mature, which mm -hmm. and their mm -hmm. girls. So that really helped out. Plus mm -hmm. I'm a talker. So we talk all the time and I probably right. talked to my kids way above their heads, mm -hmm. you know, and just expected them to follow along. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I have noticed is in the family environment that we have, we still try to have dinners together. Now my girls do work. And so sometimes that doesn't always happen, but for the most part, most days of the week, we are at the dinner table and mm -hmm. we talk about these college classes that they are yeah. in because mm -hmm. you have 15, 16 year olds, sometimes even 14 year olds being educated by a college professor who is used to working with adults, young adults. And so some things are said that were like, Hmm. Okay. I don't know that I would have necessarily wanted you to be exposed to that conversation at this point, but since you have, and you're home at night, let's talk about it. Let's mm -hmm. talk about these things. Let's grapple with how does that make you feel? And do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? How does it align with our family values? When you go to college, your kids typically live outside of your home mm -hmm. for the most part, if they, if they are, you know, at a university. And so you don't necessarily get those nightly opportunities to digest what's being taught to your child from an adult perspective that has a different mm -hmm. worldview. And mm -hmm. so for one of the positives for us is we get to walk alongside our girls as they're doing that so that when they do go to school mm -hmm. away from the home, they already have that um, roadmap on how to walk through some of those things when it's like, hmm, I don't know, just because you're an adult doesn't mean that I have to agree with what you're saying. And, and yeah. my children, we tell them question all authority with respect. I mean, that's just, it has backfired on us quite a bit <laughs> as the parents, but I think it's regardless of how much work it's caused and heartache it's caused me, it's super important. It's one of my values. Like we get to question, we have a mind mm -hmm. now, a downside that I'm really starting to feel as they are halfway through their junior year, almost they're leaving and going to start taking upper level classes at 18. Mm -hmm. So I've now started to plant some seeds about a gap year <laughs> and traveling. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and at yeah. first my husband's like, what are you doing? The whole point was, you know, they were going to just go finish for two years. I'm like, and then at 20, go into the workforce. Mm -hmm. I mean, expect them at 20 to know what they want to do for the rest of their lives. Like, so it's another thing to consider when you're thinking about dual mm -hmm. enrollment, where that puts them in the age range and lifespan of higher education mm -hmm. and what that's going to look like for them. And so at first my girls were like, we don't want a gap year. Don't you, then people don't go back to school. And so there's so many options now that they can do and travel abroad within a gap year mm -hmm. within the confines of programs that are safe and mm -hmm. they're still being educated, just maybe not classically. 
um, mm-hmm. through a college. So it ha- it's amazing. You don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm like, oh, I got to know more. I got to know when I know more then I can do better. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, even a gap year is something that can have any number of, you know, looks to it. Uh, my son had two gap years. He actually just was not ready to go to college, didn't know what he wanted to do. He worked full time for two years before an opportunity came up that seemed to fit him. Um, so, uh, and that's all he did was he worked, you know, full time and stayed at home. There was no travel, there, there was no other type of learning or educational environment. But you know what? Learning how to work full time <laughs> and be there every day, you know, eight hours a day rain or shine, you know, he would have to uh, get up to be on site, you know, at, at work at 530 in the morning, and it's a good half hour drive away. And so um, all of those things are absolutely valuable lessons that mature them as well. So there's just, that's the thing, whatever suits your kid, your family, and you, there's no one right way to do this thing. There just isn't. And I think the other thing that a lot of homeschool parents I, I think about, and I think you touched on it when you said that parents feel like they need to validate their choice mm-hmm. to, to other family members, to their neighbors, to the mm-hmm. world. And so we have this idea like, well, if we homeschool, then we go to college. See, our homeschool worked because we went to college and yeah. college is not for everyone. I actually went Very to beauty true. school when yeah. I graduated from homeschool. And then I worked in the industry before I ended up going into college. And after I got my two degrees, I still did hair when I was an adult for, tw- I mean, it's just amazing. So we, we have these ideas, but if we take that, that pressure off of ourselves as parents to say, we have to prove something, yeah. it's like, they, we don't have to prove anything. We're going to make our kids miserable because we, we have to prove that we made the right choice. There's mm-hmm. so many options beyond classical education and beyond high school. Mm-hmm. I feel like when our kids become teens and through the teen years, we learn a lot of lessons as parents. <laughs> when the kids are younger, it's very easy to feel very positive about our parenting and our homeschooling. And, oh, you know, I've got these little soldiers who will do what I tell them to do. And, and you know, we're learning how to add and subtract and divide and whatnot. And, you know, the kid who is like two grades levels above in math, right? And then we hit the teen years. <laughs> And all of a sudden that kid is struggling in math, right? Because algebra comes up and it's, it's a whole new ball game. And all of a sudden they're struggling or we hit the teen years and all of a sudden the kids are <laughs> questioning authority <laughs> and not necessarily respectfully, right? They're making decisions that were like, did, did I ever train you? Did, you know, do you, do you remember anything <laughs> that we told you about when you were younger? And um, I think the same thing is true when it comes to who, you know, where they're headed. It's, um, we have these grand ideas when they're younger. Oh, they're going to get a full ride, you know, athletic scholarship because they're so amazing. Or they're going to get a full ride academic scholarship because they're so amazing. Or um, they're going to go to this great college and, you know, just totally make a name for themselves or whatever. And through the teen years, we begin to realize that's not who this individual is. This individual is somebody completely different. And um, they change so much during those years. And I do think during those years, as parents, we tend to get a little more humbled and we need to kind of flex with that. We need to realize that this is an individual and they are a very valuable individual and what they think is just as important as what we think. And their emotions are just as important as our emotions. And just because we had these plans for them or these ideas about how things were going to go, and now they're going completely differently than we ever imagined them going, that doesn't mean it's bad or wrong. And it's going to be what's best for that kid. Um, I had them myself. I had all these, you know, the dual enrollment was kind of one of those things that when we actually got to it, no, not a good fit for us. But, you know, I was imagining my kid getting their associates and, and, you know, before graduating high school and all of those things that many people are able to do. And that is totally great for them. I'm not knocking it at all. I'm just saying it wasn't a good fit for our family. And the same thing is true about going to college or what kind of career you think they should have any of those things, we as parents need to learn to get off of our pride. It's got to go this way because that's how I'm going to look good (laughs) to 
a little more humble, hey, what do you want? What are you trying to accomplish? How can I help you get there? Yeah. And I think we have a choice as parents. Either we can be humbled by it or we can double down and and start being more authoritarian with our teenagers. And I'm here to testify that that actually doesn't work very well. Um, And if you, (laughs) and if you choose to go down that road, be prepared that you're probably going to have more pushback than necessary because they are reaching a point in their development that they are trying to be more independent. And so, Mm -hmm. and that is where they're supposed to be, which Mm -hmm. is hard for a parent like me because yeah, they're not turning out at all as I had (laughs) hoped. Mm-hmm. But or they're thoughts. turning out, yes, but they're turning out even better. Yes. Yes. And I'm like, oh, my, I keep saying, I'm going to write a book. It's called, it's going to be called in spite of me. <laughs> because, <laughs> there you go. Yes. Because I really yeah. feel like all of these things, I will give an example though. I was sitting with a guidance counselor and my daughter, both of them, as we were looking at their next steps and the guidance counselor was like, oh, well, you've fulfilled your math requirements. So there's no need for you to take higher level math. Mm. And, um, to my girls that sounded fabulous. Yes. Thank you. We're 15. We're done with math. And Mm -hmm. because I'm an adult and I no longer have holes in my frontal lobe, I had to say, (laughs) you know what, let's wait a second here at 15. Do you really know where your life is going to take you. And Mm. what if when you get down the road, you have a class or something sparks a passion in you. And then you go, oh, I can't do that because I didn't take college level algebra. And that's a requirement for this next thing. Mm -hmm. Now, could you always take it? Sure. Anybody can go back to school. Anyone can continue learning. But I just thought, why put a stumbling block in a future road or path that you don't even know you're going to take? And so I, I, uh, forcefully encouraged them <laughs> that yes, we were we were going to take college algebra, and they both they, did. They love it. No, did they get the credit? Did they understand a little bit higher um, level math? Yes. Well, that opened doors now if they decide to take another course that had that as a requirement. Yes. So, I I encourage parents to get buy in from their teens, mm. um, but not let a fifteen year old decide. <laughs> what their future is going to be because Mm -hmm. so many things are falling through that hole. (laughs) So many things. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need to, yeah, I need to clarify. I certainly wasn't needing to bend over backwards and, you know, let them make all the decisions. They're not ready. Um, I have an article on my website called uh, what to do when your kid hates homeschooling high school. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten a lot of pushback on that article because in there I say, hey, there are some things we still get to pull the parent card for. And the decision to homeschool or not to homeschool is one of those ones that I feel strongly about. You're right. They're teenagers. They don't know the long-term results or consequences of the decisions they're making right now. We're the ones that have been around the block. (laughs) We can see better hey, this decision is not a good decision because of X, Y, and Z down the road. And um, so sometimes we have to say, sorry, that's not the way that's going to happen. We are going to do it this way. But here's the reasons why. And I hope you can understand that this is why it's always about the dialogue. You know, Mm -hmm. as long as we can dialogue about these things, they don't have to agree with us, but we don't have to be disrespectful to them either. Um, we can dialogue. And as you did kind of say, Hey, let's, let's think about this a minute. Um, And so, yes, we are still their parents and we shouldn't shy away from those times when we need to pull the parent card and make a final decision. But we do need to back off of, um, as you said, the authoritarian type of parenting mindset in the teen years, it does need to become more of a dialogue a give and take. And wherever you can meet them at least halfway, it's a great idea to do so. It just builds bridges and helps that relationship. Again, for me, the relationship was the most important part of the whole homeschooling process because I wanted my kids to, you know, I wanted the family to remain intact and and the kids to be my friends as adults, right? And Mm -hmm. so um, the, the academics, the life goals, all of that is secondary to keeping that relationship vibrant and healthy and a give and take sort of situation within the bounds of it still being a parent child situation. 
And I think the more that we can give on the things that don't really matter, mm-hmm. the more they're apt to listen to us on the things that truly do matter. So yeah. when my daughter wants to wear sweatpants to fly mm. and it drives my husband nuts, <laughs> I say, does it really, does it really matter? It does. Is it really, and if it does, okay, then we'll talk about it. But, but why? Because it's how you feel they're representing you. Oh, right. Uh-huh, it's more, uh-huh. it, you, I really have, when I get that hair on the back of my neck, stand up, I'm ready to pounce on my kids. I uh-huh. really have learned to, I'm not a hundred percent, but maybe 40, 40, 60. Uh-huh. When uh-huh. I do, I'm so proud of myself. Pause and ask myself, is this for their benefit or is it for my benefit? And so when we get to the airport and 80% of the people around us have sweatpants on (laughs) and my daughter looks at my husband and goes, I don't know what the big deal is. Right. (laughs) Um, you know, that that's a learning lesson for all of us. Now back to helping them navigate classes. One of my twins was insistent. She was not going to do a college level biology course. And I really dug my heels in and I was like, you're going to do this biology course. Hmm. And we, it was not pleasant. And, and we had, I mean, even going into it, well, she went and three days in, she said, I'm dropping this class. Hmm. And I immediately want to be like, oh no, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) You want to talk about stubborn and stubborn. My daughter and I, (laughs) we are just like, you can't be more stubborn than me. She might actually be. So (laughs) I paused and I had to ask, is this for her benefit or my benefit? And when she came home and she said, it's a three and a half hour class. It's at the end of the day. She's my child that needs to be by herself to feel comfortable. She can give so much and then she's got to be, you know, pull back. And she actually went in and and figured out a schedule that was going to work that she didn't, wasn't going to take that class. And the part of me that was my my pride in parenting that said, you're not going to tell me what you're going to do. I had to stop and go, okay, well, she's almost 17. And if there are consequences from this decision, she's going to actually have to bear the weight of that. And if there's not, then she's showing me that she can make good decisions on her own. Mm -hmm. But that was a hard pill to swallow. (laughs) Not a big fan of being told no by my children. (laughs) But I also want them to be adults. I want them to not have to call me. And when they're gone, um, of course they can. And I will appreciate that and love that. But at the same time, if they're able to make these decisions without needing constant um, affirmation to their choices, Mm -hmm. then I think, okay then we're doing a good job. Yeah, there you go. That's awesome. Fingers crossed. (laughs) Fingers crossed. I hope, I hope. What are some other things that you hear in your community about homeschooling high school that you just want to put to rest for some people or or put their mind at ease? Yeah, probably one of the biggest is the whole idea of opportunities. Um, That if you keep your kids in your home for homeschooling through the high school years, that they're going to miss out on all of the opportunities that are provided by the public school or a private school. And, um, you know, I don't think that's true. I think, yes, they will miss out on the opportunities provided by the public school. Now, in some places, you can totally, as your daughter is, take advantage of certain opportunities that are at the public school, such as athletic teams or choirs or bands or what have you. But so... But in the areas where you can't, yeah, they might not be able to do those things, but there's usually a reasonable substitute. So for instance, my daughter played violin and she joined the community youth orchestra. It was a community thing. Anybody, any kid could join. And so she was in that. Um, You know, you can, if if your kid is an athlete, then travel ball teams are actually better, you know, looked at by college coaches because they actually do real sports, (laughs) sports, <laughs> you know, higher level sporting uh, instruction goes on at the travel teams than does usually by the coach at a school who is also a teacher and, you know, um, may not even really be a coach, like they were never trained to be a coach type of thing. It just depends, obviously. Um, so uh, that's another thing that you can usually find elsewhere. Um, most of the time, homeschooling provides a better opportunity for your kid to explore their interests than being horned in to a 
public school schedule where they're at school from here to here and then they've got homework up to here. Um, in the meantime, your kid at home has all day almost to explore what interests them. The other thing about my daughter is uh, she was kind of behind on her violin learning curve schedule. She started kind of late and then decided she wanted to major in it. And so she had to get through a certain level of instruction instruction in a very short period of time to get up to the level to be ready to audition for college. So she needed to practice three to four hours a day. This was all driven by her. This was not anything that I tried to do. Um, she, she's just a very self-motivated individual. And um, she could not have practiced like that three to four hours every day if she had been involved in, in been going to public school. So being home gave her the opportunity to have that opportunity to get ready to audition at college. So there are so many ways that homeschooling does not limit your opportunities, but actually opens that up, them up. And the other side of that coin is there are some opportunities at the schools that we didn't want our kids to have, right? We didn't want our kids to be exposed to drugs. We didn't want our kids to be exposed to teen sex. We didn't want our kids to be instructed about sex and all of those other things by the government mandated, you know, lists of things that need to be covered. Um, so uh, among other things, you know, bullying and peer pressure is, is another one. So um, those opportunities that you, your kids get at the schools, we didn't want our kids to have those. So we were happy they were missing on those opportunities, right? So I just think if anybody is making their decision based on, oh, there's so much more that they can take part in at the school, don't, don't make your decision based on that. With a little creativity and a little effort, you can generally replace just about anything that goes on there with something that you're able to do through your homeschool or even better. Yeah, that's a great encouragement because I do think that parents um, worry. And it's funny because sometimes I talk to parents and I said, okay, well, you were a cheerleader in high school. Your husband played football. There's no guarantees that that's what your children want to do. Right. That's so true. <laughs> so we don't, we don't have to live vicariously through our children. We don't have to relive those glory days. I didn't have glory days in high school. So there was no misconception for me there. Um, I was grateful for that. Very grateful. And why don't you tell our listeners um, where they can find your material? How can they connect with what you're doing in the homeschool community? Sure. So the main place would be my website, not that hard to homeschool.com. It's mostly geared toward high school, but um, I am going to be developing sort of a K to eight section in there as well. So that's going to be coming soon with more and more articles about K to eight. Also, Facebook groups are, are um, a great place. I have two of them. One of them is called It's Not That Hard to Homeschool High School. It just reached 34,000 members here a few days ago. And then the other one is it's not that hard to homeschool K through eight and it's over 10,000 members. So they're both great places to come and talk to other moms. If you ask, want to quest, ask a question about a particular curriculum and anybody else's experience with it, or if you're having this particular conundrum about how to schedule things, or your teen is doing something, that, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, with their math and you can't figure it out, any number of questions you can come and ask and hear pretty much right away from other moms. We also have sponsors in those groups who will communicate directly with you, interact with you about their products. And that's been really helpful for everybody. It's totally non-obtrusive. It's not in your face, um, but you can literally just talk directly to the curriculum provider with your questions. And that's pretty cool too. And then, uh, I mean, I've got a very tiny Instagram account. I wouldn't necessarily, and I also have a few YouTube videos. They're great <laughs> such as they are, you know, but um the other thing, uh, though, is the podcast called It's Not That Hard to Homeschool High School, and that comes out every first and third Friday, and you can look for that on, I'm pretty sure, almost any podcast outlet that you would have on your phone or wherever it is that you listen to them, and so those are the places to find me, and if I can be so bold, I just wanted to share, too, that I do have a couple of books. Um, this is the flagship book. It's called Cure the Fear of Homeschooling High School, and it will walk you through the research and planning process to get ready for high school so that you know you haven't missed anything. And yet still within that idea of you get to pick what's best for your kid and you, and then save your sanity while homeschooling high school um, is a great companion to cure the fear. And it will uh, help you set reasonable expectations so you're not burdening yourself and setting yourself up for overwhelm. And then 
uh, for the record is all about grading and paperwork. And then uh, taming the transcript is about making that transcript for your kid because you can make one from scratch. You don't need to buy a service. You can, but you don't need. Wonderful. Well, before we go, why don't you share a homeschool hack with our families? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll share two, but I'll make them both very quick. Uh, the first one is in general, don't grade daily work. No need to grade daily work. This applies from K through 12, um, but it was really helpful in high school. Remember that when a kid is has learned something from a lesson and now they're like maybe doing comprehension questions or they're doing math practice problems, those are practice. They just were exposed to something and now they're getting the opportunity to practice it. It's not really fair to grade them on practice. That's like grading them when you take them out for a driver's training session. <laughs> you know, they're still learning how to drive. Are you going to knock off points because they do a rolling stop? You know, no, you're not. We're just in the process of learning here. And so um, daily work, you can take a whole lot of work off your plate if you only put a grade on things like chapter tests and final drafts of papers or final projects. You still want to correct the daily work, obviously, to find out what was wrong and you know go back and fix it in some way, but you don't need to actually assign a grade to that. And that just makes everything so much easier. And when your kid is in high school, maybe they can start grading their daily work or checking their daily work. Second hack is uh, when you're dealing with a teen, let them sleep in. <laughs> It'll make for a happier life for both of you. Use those hours in the morning when your kid is still sleeping to work with the younger kids, but let your teen sleep in because they need a lot of sleep during this age. And I think it will help uh, everything in the household run a little smoother because they won't be so cranky. <laughs> That's just another one. And then in turn, we won't be so cranky. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Well, Anne, thank you so much for coming on and talking us to us today about why we really shouldn't be nervous to homeschool during high school. And thank you for the resources that you offer the homeschool community, all the work, the blood, sweat, and tears that you have put in over these years. We, um, as homeschool moms coming up into this, I, I speak for all of us when I say thank you and we appreciate you. <laughs> well, it's been my pleasure, all of it. And uh, thank you for having me on here today. This has been fun. Thank you guys for watching. Until next time. Bye.